I asked the Lord, Father, you know, trying to be so spiritual, Father, what is it that you want to say to your people today? What's, what's on your heart? Because there's so many ideas, but unless it comes from you, there's no eternal deposit, there's no change, nothing happens. So he gave me the phrase, transfer in order to transform. Transfer in order to transform. And then I, um, I ended up in John chapter 6. So I'm going to read the first 14 verses, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. We all know the story, the loaves and the fishes. And so after this, Jesus went to the farther side of the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd was following Jesus because they'd seen the signs and the miracles which he continually performed upon those who were sick. And Jesus walked up the mountainside and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was approaching. Jesus looked up then, and seeing that a vast multitude was coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that all these people may eat? But Jesus said this to prove or to test him, for he well knew what he was about to do. So there we have the foresight of the Holy Spirit, the revelation that comes from being in the presence of God, that he well knew what he was about to do. And Philip answered him, 200 pennies worth of bread is not enough that everyone may receive even a little. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there's a little boy here who has with him five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, make all the people recline. Now the ground was covered with thick grass at the spot, so the men threw themselves down, about 5,000 in number. Probably 15, 20,000 if you include the women and the children. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples and the disciples to the people who were reclining. So Jesus did with the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had all had enough, he said to his disciples, gather up now the fragments so that nothing may be lost or wasted. So accordingly, they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with fragments left over by those who'd eaten from the five barley loaves. And then when the people saw the sign that Jesus had performed, they began saying, surely and beyond a doubt, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. There's a couple of things there that I want to bring out. That when Jesus asked the question in, chapter, in verse 5, where are we to buy bread so that all these people may eat? What was he looking for, do you think? Faith. Faith. But what did he get? Yeah. Facts. facts. He got facts. And how often do we pray facts mm -hmm. instead of faith answers? So Jesus is looking for faith, but Philip, bless his heart, very practical, very logical, very rational, very analytical. Well, these are the, these are the facts, Jesus. And basically in verse 7, what we see is something that we often hear. It's too little, it's too late, and the need is too much. The need is too much. We can't possibly feed all these people. It's too late. In the Matthew 14 version of this, of this parable, it was the end of the day. Where can we go? It's day's evening. You know, everything's shut down. It's too little. The need is too great. We have too little. And it's really too late. Has anybody got situations in their life where they feel like the need is too great, or it's too late, it's too little, whatever. If you have needs in your life in those areas, the Father is wanting to transform them. That's Abba's heart. And in Matthew chapter 14, 
where it starts in um, verse 13. Jesus heard he withdrew from there privately in a boat to a solitary place. So quite often when we feel that it's too little, it's too much, it's too late, I can't cope, I'm overwhelmed, whatever, it's a solitary place. We isolate ourselves from people who can pray with us, stand with us, we pull back. We say men go into their caves, women go into their false refuges and their emotions. We pull back into a solitary place. And when the crowds heard of it, they followed Jesus by land on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore and saw a great throng of people, he had compassion for them and cured them. But when evening came, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote and barren place. Are there areas in your life that are barren? Financially barren, relationally barren, physically barren. Areas in your life where there's a barrenness, no matter how much you, you stand on the word, no matter how much you decree, no matter how much communion you take, no matter how much fasting you do, it still stays barren. Not a lot of life there. And it's sort of like, oh, well, I guess that's the way it is. And it's remote. It's like so far away from the hand of God. Anyone ever felt like that? Well, this is a very real parable for those times. And where it says um, in verse 16, Jesus said, they don't need to go away, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. So Jesus said, bring them here to me. This is the start of the transfer. Bring them here to me. And I know for me personally that sometimes I have situations in my family where I bring them to Jesus I bring the situation, I bring the person, the prodigal, whatever, to Jesus. But it's almost like it's got chewing gum on it. And I take it back and inspect and see how much Jesus has actually done or what's actually happening. I can't quite seem to leave it in his hands. I'm sure I'm not the only one. But Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to recline on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, which is not in the parable in John, but it's in Matthew. He said, looking up to heaven, it is a Greek word, anabeplo, and it actually means to refocus, to recover sight. So in the natural, he's looking at all of these thousands of people spread out before him. He's looking at five loaves and two small fish that have come from a small boy's lunch. And in the natural, that is like too little, too much, and it's the evening. We can't go anywhere to feed them. It's too late. It's a remote and a barren place. So he needed to refocus to get back in the spirit. Because remember, Jesus was a human being like us. And he was under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He walked the earth as the Son of Man, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So whatever he did, we can do. He showed us how to live as a human being, even though he was also Son of God. Hypostatic union, they call it in Bible college. But the thing is, he had to refocus. So there are times when we hand things over, and you get that urge to have a worry. So I said something to Danielle today. I, I said, oh, she's so tired. She's been looking after me and trying to do my work and her work. And she's just been amazing. And I said to her, I'm worried about you. And they said, no, I'm not worried. Worry's a sin. I'm concerned about you, but I've cast the care. So you know what I mean? But, you know, you've got to, you've got to be so careful of the, the attitudes and, and, like Kate said, the way we think. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes we have to refocus. Stop looking in the natural and actually ascend. But when you ascend, you ascend in Christ. There's a lot of Christians who ascend, but they do it illegally. They don't ascend through Christ. They don't ascend through the blood. They don't come through the door. And so they ascend illegally. 
and then all sorts of weird things kind of get caught up. But take the time and ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to ascend so that you are actually seated with Christ in heavenly places. And you can look down and you can see the situation as Christ did. We need to be able to anabeplo. We need to be able to refocus. We need to be able to see as Christ sees, not as we see, not as we think, not as we've been told, not as we've been taught, but what is Jesus actually seeing when he looks into this? And what Jesus is always seeing is good news because he is good news. Jesus is good news. You know, so I speak to the prodigals of my family. And I say, prodigals, you listen to me in the realm of the spirit. I've got good news for you. You ain't got no choice but to come on home. Because that's the love of the Father calling you back. Right? So I can get worried about them. I can think, oh, my gosh, what are they doing now? Look at this. Seriously. God, do something. But now, as for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. End of story. I need to continue to see it as he sees it. I need to refocus. And there are times after a phone call and you hang up that phone or you see something on Facebook. I need to refocus yesterday. Like, you know, I just need to refocus. But we need to learn to ascend, to truly ascend. Because there are, as I said before, there are some Christians who think they are ascending, but it is a false ascension. We can only ascend through Jesus Christ, through the power of his blood. It's only through him. If we try to do it in our own spirit, by our own strength, it's, not, it's out of order. Basically, it's just out of order and we need to be able to come into order. But even Jesus needed to refocus. But Jesus also prepared the people to expect to receive because he said to them, you need to sit down in groups. You need to recline. So he was teaching the people, release your faith for an expectation. They had no idea that all he had was five loaves and two small fish. They had no idea that the pantry was empty. They had no idea that um, there was not enough. Nobody had gone shopping. But they were told to sit down in groups, and so they did. So he prepared the people to release an expectation. So in the remote areas, the barren areas of your lives, in those areas where you are believing God, are you releasing expectation? Because that's what faith is. Faith expects. Faith works. And faith, Jesus' faith was working when he said, Bring the fish and the loaves to me and tell them to sit down. He was getting things in order for the manifestation of, of the miracle. And we have to learn to do the same thing. Are you releasing an expectation? Some of us, you know, have been believing God for years for something and the expectation can dry up. The expectation can get a bit of a hard edge to it. But we've got to come back to the fact is God, you're faithful. And you are the God of hope. So fill me again with hope. Raise my expectation by the power of the Spirit. I expect you to move. I expect to see something change. I expect because I'm living by faith. And so I need to refocus and anabeplo like Jesus did when he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. And one of the greatest keys that you can do is to look up to heaven, to refocus, to take your place in the heavenlies with him and give thanks. Because thanksgiving is a key that opens opens nearly every situation. 1 yes. Thessalonians chapter 5 verse th verse 18. Jesus, you know, we were told, "Give thanks in everything. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is God's will." And if we can't live that will, then how are we going to live the specific will of God for our lives? That's the general will of God. Give thanks in everything. And I don't give thanks for everything, 
but I give thanks that he's with me in everything, that his provision is with me in everything, that his promises are with me in everything. But this giving thanks is a key and it unlocks things and Jesus actually refocused and then he gave thanks and he blessed the fish and the loaves and we need to release the power of thanksgiving into harsh situations and harsh circumstances to release the presence of God, the power of God, the provision of God, the, uh, the, the kingdom of God. And sometimes the giving of thanks is through gritted teeth. God, I'm not thrilled that I'm in this. This is not what I had planned in my life. But I give you thanks. And, and honestly, God, there's not a lot of joy in that. It's through gritted teeth, you know my heart, but I give you thanks. In agreement with your word, I give you thanks that you are with me in this, that you have the way out of this for me, that, that everything, nothing is, we're never bailed up in a corner with our Father. He loves you too much. He loves you too much to trap you, to keep you caught up in a corner. He's always got the way out, and the way out is always Jesus. I bought a book. So that I did a, a seminar on Thursday night, webinar, oh, I don't know what you call them, a webinar on Thursday night called Over 100 Weapons of God. And... Um, yeah, and I didn't touch on a lot of the other ones, <laughs> spirit of burning, spirit of judgment and all of that, I didn't touch on those. But there's just over 100 that I talked about. And at the back of it, I, I, I put in... Um, there's, I did a 31-page workbook that went with the webinar. And at the back of the webinar, I put in um, the names of God that I had, um, compound names of God, names of Jesus, names of the Holy Spirit. And there's over 300. I haven't got all of them. <laughs> because there's a book called Hashem, which you get from Morris Cirillo Ministries, which has 365 Jewish names of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And each, you know, there's the Jewish name, then there's the scripture, then there's a little teachy thing, and then there's the prayer. That's our daily devotional, or almost daily devotional, uh, in our home. We did it last year, and uh, it touched my grandson so much, and I thought, I'll just get him one for Christmas. So he's got his own copy, because, um, you know, you never know when they're going to leave home. And, uh, he's, and he came to me, as I'm presenting it to him, he said, oh, he said, I was going to ask you to get me one of these. And so we're going through it again because every time we go through it, it's richer. But there's over 365 Jewish names, right? And then I bought a book. I'm always buying books. I need to curtail that. Maybe it's a false refuge. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just love to learn about God. Um, but this book was written by the guy that wrote the One New Man Bible. And it's got names of God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit in it, and some of them I've never seen before. So it's almost like this endless, limitless facets of God being released and being unveiled. And when you know, you know, like Jesus is the door, Jesus is the morning star, you know, um, the Holy Spirit, the sanctuary of God. When you start to know the name, Holy Spirit's also a spirit of war, yeah, yeah. right? You can use him in warfare or be led by him in warfare. So we've got all the Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. We've got all these amazing names. And as you start to worship them and praise them and glorify him, particularly if it's suited for your, for your situation, you are learning to refocus and release the blessing of the names of God into those situations. So we need to know him, not just, you know, in worship and soaking in his presence. But there are some names in the Jewish Hashem devotional. I thought, I've never heard of this one. I've never heard of this. And so it opens our, our hearts and our, our spirits and our souls up to deeper worship and greater thanksgiving. Yeah, right. You know, it's just, and, and they're kind of like, they're his names. But as we walk in his names, because we are the body of Christ, as we walk in his names, 
enveloped in his names, they also are weapons of God. We need to know him, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, at a much deeper level than we do. And you know what? You don't have to buy the books. Shock horror, did I just say that? You don't have to buy the books. Just simply say, Holy Spirit, will you introduce me to the Father and to the Son and to yourself? Take me into your school. Teach me your names. Show me your character. Reveal things to me. This is what, when your faith is founded on the faithfulness of God and the names of God reveal his faithfulness, you're solid. You're rock, you're on a rock. Jesus the rock. Always amazes me when they went through the wilderness and they were followed by the rock, Christ. I drew a little picture in one of my Bibles of a rock with tiny little feet just following a crowd. But that was Jesus, you know, like, how amazing, Jesus the rock, and he's full of water. You know, he, and then he stands up in John chapter 7 and he says, if you're thirsty, come to me, because I've, I've watered millions in the wilderness, you know. He never runs dry. So we need to know him. So those remote areas, those barren places, those areas where you need to refocus and to give thanks and, and, and realise that thanksgiving is an absolute key. For one, it, just, it, it absolutely undermines the work of the spirit of Ziz. But another thing is that it just releases um, the power of the, of the Holy Spirit in a brand new way because you're actually saying God is enough. I don't need anything else in this situation. My God is enough. My God meets every need I have. He's all I need. My God is enough. And that's what Jesus did when he refocused and he looked at, what, 20,000, 15, 20,000 people, five loaves and two fish from a small boy's lunchbox. My God is enough. My God is enough. My God is enough. He's enough. He's more than enough. He is El Shaddai. He is more than enough. He is more than enough for every situation, every circumstance, everything you're going through. He is more than enough. So, you know, we release the more than enough of an amazing God into every situation and circumstance of your life. Let there be multiplication because when he refocused, when he gave thanks, when they started to distribute what they had, the spirit of multiplication was released. And there was more than enough. There were 12 baskets of leftovers they had to pick up because God doesn't waste anything in his kingdom. They were there for something else, provision for tomorrow, whatever it might be. But understand that whatever you transfer into the hands of Jesus is transformed by the promise, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So those fish and loaves were transferred into the hands of Jesus. Jesus said, give them to me. They were given to him. And then transformation came. So are there any areas in our life where we maybe have not transferred everything over to Jesus. We say, man, I, it's so easy to say, he's the Lord of my life. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit will come along and say, but what about here? Oh, oh I, I thought, I didn't think. I repent. You know, I'll turn away from that. I'll come back to the cross and the grace. But are there areas where maybe because of hurt, trauma, pain, loneliness, lack, suffering, maybe because of issues of the past, current issues, where we haven't really transferred it into his hands? Like, yeah, Jesus, you can have it but it's still attached to me. You can have it, but don't do anything because it's still too sore. Yes, Jesus, you can have it. I'm transferring it across to you, but don't touch it. 
don't go into that room in my soul. Leave that. We all go through phases where we think we have totally surrendered and committed only to find that if we listen, there are areas that he's saying, give it to me. Bring it to me. Leave it with me. And I was praying for something in my family years ago, diligently praying. Probably nagging would be a better word than praying. <laughs> but diligent I was, diligent. Faithfully, Faithfully reminding God, you know, this needs to be fixed. This needs to be fixed. Thank you, God, that you're fixing this. And then I'm praying, nagging, whatever. And I get a vision of a little girl sitting at the kitchen table with a broken toy. And the father's trying to fix it. And she keeps going, but what about here? But what about here? And with the little fingers keep getting in the way of the father fixing the toy. So the father leant over and picked the little girl up, which was me, and put me in a corner and said, stay there until I fix it. <laughs> Get out of the way. And sometimes there are places where we are in the way. Because of what someone said, someone did, how we responded. It can be because of shame or guilt. It can be anything. But sometimes we get in the way. And that is not transferring it across to Jesus. That is simply flesh, basically. But when we transfer, whether it's time, talents, treasures, trust, when we transfer hurts, traumas or pain, whatever we transfer, he transforms. So when we, transformed our, when we transferred our life and said, Jesus, I want you to be my saviour and my Lord, I transferred my life to him. Now, I didn't understand what I was doing, fully didn't get it. I just knew I needed to do it. Right, which is like most of us. I've got to respond to this. This is right. Not realising that, you know, my spirit's regenerated, my soul needs work, my flesh is never going to agree with God, all of that kind of stuff. But when I transferred my life to God through Jesus Christ, he transformed us and made us new creations. He made us temples of the Holy Spirit. He made us light and salt. He filled us with himself. He transformed us. We've got the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. He transformed us. Yeah. So how much of that transformation we walk in is up to us, but he transformed us. He made us overcomers more than conquerors, people who always triumph in Christ. He made us covenant keepers. He transformed us. Yeah. Thank you. And that was just the start. He transferred us. Or we, we, I'm getting my words mixed up. He, we transferred our lives to God and God said, okay, I'm transforming everything right now out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Massive transformation. Yes, it is. But that's where it's the Holy Spirit, help me. Amen. Holy Spirit, help me to leave it there. And sometimes I have said, God, go ahead and answer this prayer. I know I'm not going to like it. I know you're going to have to work in me. And I probably will have a hissy fit or a dummy spit or something. But I give you full permission to go ahead and work it all out right through to the glorious end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how I might kick and scream all the way. Being honest. So we need to transfer areas in our life that are not bearing fruit. We need to transfer maybe a fresh and a new areas that seem a bit barren. Prayers that have gone dry. 
maybe relationships that are not what they should be in God. But we, we all need to reassess what we transfer. And as we partake of communion today, as you transfer whatever it is the Holy Spirit lays on your heart, as you transfer that across, through the cross to the grace of God, through Jesus and his blood, receive the transformation. Receive the transformation. And let me tell you, the biggest enemy is going to be your soul. Because it's going to tell you you're not worthy enough, you're not good enough, he's not acting quick enough, this isn't working out the way you thought it would. Your soul, if it is not renewed, is going to fight you. So that's, you know, as Kate said, we're going to have to bring every thought into obedience to Christ, but refocus. Refocus and give thanks. Bless the situation. Three easy steps, refocus, give thanks, I bless the situation with God's best outcome. Because I want what he wants. Yeah? So as we partake of communion, think about the areas that maybe the Holy Spirit might be prodding you or talking to you about really transferring across to Jesus. Refocus, give thanks, bless, and receive the transformation. And then water it with thanksgiving. Just turn to number six and then we'll take communion. This is the, um, the ironic blessing. Amplified. But we stop, we stop at a certain place and we miss out on verse 27. So verse 24, the Lord bless you, watch God and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, enlighten you, be gracious, kind, merciful and give favour to you. The Lord lift up his approving countenance upon you and give you peace, tranquility of heart and life continually. And we end there. But the next verse says, and they shall put my name upon the Israelites. So Lord, we ask you to put your name upon us and bless us in agreement with Mary Ann's prayer. Amen. So, if you want to come and um, get communion, and we're just going to do it um, corporately but individually, if it makes sense, you're going to be making, you know, transferring across to the Lord during communion what you need to give to him or what he's asking for. Lord, will you please show us what you are asking us to transfer into your hands? And when you're ready, come and take communion transfer and receive by faith transformation and then we'll pray so the tithes originally were because of Abram was just so grateful to God it wasn't anything that God said to Abram Abram just said wow I've met with Melchizedek I've been blessed by God God's blessed me I've blessed God I've had wine and communion Whoa. So he says, I'm just going to give, give back to God a tenth. So the tithe originated from a heart of gratitude from, a, from man. Yes. And then God, as that was transferred to God, God transformed that into a covenant. He transformed it into a holy thing. So according to Genesis 14 and Jacob 28, for those who tithe... And I understand if you can't afford to tithe. I started off, I think, at 3% because I was a single mum with, with a stack of kids and the thought of giving 10% meant I couldn't feed my children. So I thought I don't have faith to tithe, but I do have faith to give 3% and to pray to tithe my time. And then slowly, you know, and now I live on 50% of my income. 
But let me bless you. Everyone who tithes, <clears throat> whether here or online, I bless you with a covenant guarantee of God's promise. I bless you with the fact that God will represent you in every situation and circumstance you are in. In fact, doesn't he say in Malachi 12 that he will rebuke the devourer, God himself, the Lord of hosts, will rebuke the devourer for your personal sake. I bless you with the purpose, the passage, and the power of God for your life as he directs your steps. I bless you with divine provision, for you will never see the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I bless you with clothing and shelter and protection from adversities and climates, cyclones, whatevers. And I bless you with protection against hostile people until we return to our Father's house in peace. I bless you because God has given you the power to get wealth in order to establish his covenant upon the earth. And I bless you with a generational blessing that as you tie, that goes down into future generations and brings forth victory and blessing. Amen. And thank you, Father, for everyone who gives offerings, that it would be given back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Let people pour it back into their lives. For those who bring first fruits, Lord, I thank you that first fruits bring a specific blessing upon the house for generational blessings. I thank you. I thank you, God, for those who give alms to the poor, for as we give to the poor, we lend to you and you ensure that it comes back. Father God, we declare that everything we have is yours. Teach us to be wise stewards and prepare us for the future. In Jesus' name, amen.